coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. All right, this is another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. Coming to you live from Black Iron Jam in Reno, Nevada. I am your host, Chad Wesley Smith, joined as always by magnanimous Max Montana. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty well. How are you doing? Good, good. So we have our, our best looking crowd we've ever had. This is the best crowd we've ever had, yeah. yeah. Biggest, biggest, craziest crowd we've ever had. The only crowd we've ever had. But uh, very, very fun day here. Just finished up a little little snatch workshop and uh, now going to be talking about bar height and, and some different ideas with snatch technique and taking questions. So before we get into all of that, we want to thank, uh, well, first off, thank Black Iron Jim for hosting us. Uh, thank our sponsor, Pastries and Power Snatches. It's a lesser known sister brand of uh, donuts and deadlifts, but still a lifestyle. And uh, Thank you to uh, Kiana and Alexandra uh, for, for helping us out here. Now let's just go ahead and, and jump, right, jump right into it. Uh, bar height. Bar height's going to be our, our topic today. Uh, Max, what is bar height and how is that important and, re and relate to technique for the snatch? It's, uh, it's how high the bar goes. Oh, oh so, so <laughs> appropriately named. <laughs> so it's kind of a fancy term. We're talking about like bar height. What we're really talking about is is uh, how high you're pulling the bar relative to your body height, okay? And the reason this is important is because it allows us to determine how efficient you are. Um, you know, there's, there's gonna be a limit as to how high you need to pull the bar in order to catch the weight at the bottom. We all know, we can all kind of discern from, from watching someone lift, if they pull the bar really, really high and they catch it in a power snatch or a power clean uh, and then ride it down, Obviously, they're strong enough to lift the bar high enough, but they're not necessarily efficient enough to get under the weight. So when we talk about relative bar height or bar height, we're always talking about it relative to the height of the person, right? How high are you actually pulling the bar before you actually get under the weight? And how high do you need to do, how high do you need to pull the bar uh, versus how high you actually pull it? So do you ever refer to this as like, you know, this guy's a chin puller, he's a nipple puller, he's a belly button puller. If someone's a belly button puller, they're very efficient. I, if they're an eyeball puller, they, they need some yeah, extra work on this. Yeah, that's only in a private notebook. I keep track of everybody in, you know, little terms like that. Uh, no, I mean, you know, the big thing is just, there's, there's probably gonna be a ratio or probably a percentage that's good across all boards, you know, good across the board for everybody versus really, really not good. And that, that is about 70% of your actual height. So if you're pulling the bar, much higher than that, you probably need to work on things other than pulling the bar higher. Makes sense? Yeah, and, and this all goes back to the concept of, of a weightlifting technique triad and that interrelationship. Bar height, bar trajectory, time to fixation, or speed under the bar. And you, know, you could have someone who's tremendously strong, tremendously powerful, and they can par pull the bar very, very high, but they can't snatch a heavy weight because they're lacking one or both of the other components. So it, it's all got to work together if you want to be really efficient and really effective as a weightlifter. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about it. I guess we'll, we'll kind of go and show, uh, uh, I'll, we'll go over some drills and stuff here. Yeah. Kind of show some things. So I'm going to have uh, Alex. Before we go into the drills, we'll take a quick break. Here from one of our sponsors, Health IQ, and we'll be back with this special Jug Life Live episode. Cheer again. Cheer. <laughs> Everyone, a few more beers here. Yeah. All right. If, if you guys don't drink those, Keegan and I got to drink it all, and that would be, that'd be something. The Jug Life is proud to be sponsored by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people like powerlifters, weightlifters, and crossfitters get lower rates on their life insurance. Go to healthiq.com slash juglife to support the show and see if you qualify. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health-conscious people, including powerlifters, weightlifters, and crossfitters. 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 and 33% 
on their life insurance. These savings are exclusive to Health IQ. Health IQ can save our customers up to 33% because physically active people have a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 20% lower risk of cancer, and a 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to people who are inactive. Like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. Learn more and get a free quote at healthiq.com slash juglife. That's to see if you qualify and get your free quote at healthiq.com slash juglife or mention the promo code juglife when you talk to a Health IQ agent. All right, we are back with our special Jug Life Live episode from Black Iron Gym in Reno, Nevada. I think every time I say live, just cheer out of control. Maybe one of the little signs up there. Oh, yeah, applause. Applause, yeah. <laughs> Meh. Yeah. Well, that's why this is the first one of these we've done, so we're, just, we're sorting out all the kinks. Yeah. Um, so just finished up a snatch workshop with these fine folks, and now Coach Max Ada and Alexandra, no pants, the chance. You know, you're wearing pants. This is going to be confusing to everyone. They're tights. They're tights. Imposter. Are going to talk about how to develop bar height. So take it away, Max. So let's... What we're going to do is show you kind of an example. So if, if Alex, you just step by step over there. So if Alex is doing a snatch, right? So just do a regular snatch from the hip or something and then pause at the bottom. So when she catches the bar, right? This is this point the bar is at in the bottom. This is what we would refer to as the lowest point of fixation. So this is the there's no lower she can possibly get and catch the bar, right? She can't squeeze under anymore. So this is a finite fixed point we know. When she pulls, so if you stand up again, let's just pretend that bottom position is right here, okay? We know she has to pull, pull the bar higher than this, or at least this high, okay? In order to get under the bar, she has to get, have some time. So the bar's gotta pass that minimum height. The maximum height she pulls it to is gonna be wherever it is, wherever the maximum height of the bar is when she, when she actually catches it. So what we're talking about and we wanna develop is pulling the bar, one, high enough, so let's just say here, so that she can get under the bar, so leave it there and then squat under, and catch it, but not so high, so do another one, like way up here, so that when she actually catches it, she's let's say about halfway, she stops here, all the way there, and then she rides it down, okay? Does that ever make sense, everybody? So when she's pulling the bar, we wanna develop enough power that we can pull the bar high enough, have enough time to get under it, but not so much in excess that we're doing a power snatch or a power clean every time we do the lift. The main component that drives the height of the bar, the main thing is gonna be strength. As you get stronger, as you get more powerful, you're gonna be able to pull the bar to a higher, higher, higher and higher height. The thing in weightlifting is that we don't necessarily want the bar to always just go higher and higher because then you're gonna be catching it where? Higher and higher, right? So, we're working with this kind of range here where we want to catch it, we want to pull the bar to. And we've talked about before, that's about 70% of our actual body height. So drills and exercises that really help us develop the height of the bar are going to be strength-based things. They're going to be trained in a way that's, you know, the loading is going to be more emphasizing of developing strength and power. Some of those drills are going to include, so we'll take the actual bar. If you, if you lack bar height, right, if you're someone who pulls the bar, into the right place almost, but it's just not high enough. You're not able to get the bar to a high enough position to actually catch the weight. Or if you're just not powerful enough to lift a heavier weight. You have strong legs, let's say. You, you have a good overhead squat. You, you can overhead squat more than you can snatch. You can put the bar in the right spot with light weights, meaning you catch it behind your head. But you just can't get the bar higher. You can't lift more weight. There's a couple exercises you need to work on. Obviously, one is building strength. Another is building more height to the pull. So the two main things we're gonna do are power snatches. So you can do a couple power snatches. And the one thing we all can look at, super obvious with a power snatch versus a squat snatch, the bar's higher, right? So she does another one and pauses when she catch it. Yeah, just pause in the bottom. Or in the, like, in the bottom, right there. So much higher, right? She still catches it tight and the bar doesn't drop a lot, but she's catching it higher. She's pulling it harder, okay? This is allowing us to develop the speed and technique of the actual snatch, but at the same time, developing more height to the pull because we're pulling harder. We have to generate more power to get the bar to a higher position, okay? 
This is the kind of exercise we would use later in training when we're getting close to a meet, when we kind of, when you have good, you're, you're strong already, you can move the bar well, but you're not able to actually pull it to the right height. So doing things like power snatch, really good option for this. The other exercises are like snatch pulls, okay? And these are a lot more common for people. People maybe have a hard time pulling the bar, they have a hard time generating force. It's easier to develop that with pulls because you can do many, many reps of pulls without getting super tired, right? It would be really difficult to do sets of five in the snatch or sets of five in the power snatch and have your technique stay good and use enough weight to get stronger. So we do things like pulls, so like a snatch pull, like a high pull. The first variation is like a snatch high pull, right? Where she makes contact, the bar comes up, and she keeps her elbows above the bar, two, two or three, okay? We notice here right away, the bar's coming up higher. This is a light weight, but it would still come up about as high as the actual snatch. But you can use really heavy weights with this, okay? You can use 100%, 105% of your actual snatch and develop the strength to move the bar to the higher position, right? Well, to clarify what we're talking about, because we always want to pull the bar to the same place. So as you get stronger, you should be able to pull the same weight. If your best snatch is 100 kilos and you pull it to 70% of your height, and you get strong enough now to pull 80 kilos to 70% of your height, you should be able to lift more. Does that make sense? That's pretty straightforward. The next drill, even more to the side of developing strength, is what we call like a snatch pull to the hip, or some people would call it like a snatch deadlift. So where she's doing the snatch pull before, she has to bring the bar up, she has to make contact. You can only use a limited amount of weight. You're not gonna be able to put on 20% more than your best snatch and still have your technique stay good and the bar come up close and stay high. This exercise is better suited to developing more strength. So if you're on the, the spectrum of like, your technique's okay and your, or sorry, if your technique is okay, you need to do more strength work. If your technique is not so good, you need to do more technique work. So on the more technique work side, power snatch, snatch high pull, it's lighter weight, it's closer to the weight you use in the actual snatch, it can develop a little bit of strength and a little bit of technique. If you're on the side of you've got really, really good technique, but very, very weak, this exercise is much better suited because you can use much, much heavier weights than you do in the snatch and develop more and more strength. So go ahead and do a snatch deadlift or a snatch pull to the hip. Yeah, like we did in the, the drill. Just like we did in the drill, right? So come over a little more, yeah. Generally we do them in this way like we, we all practiced in the, in the uh, clinic, so go down again. And what this does is it does, it does a couple of things. One, it teaches us how to maintain position, develop static strength in our back, and then uh, the positional strength throughout the pull, but at the same time, so come up, you can use really heavy weights here because you don't have to get a second pull, you don't have to make contact, and you don't have to bring the bar up very high. She's not gonna be able to do this exercise with, let's say, you know, 220 or 230 pounds here, and then, only snatch 60 pounds, right? As she gets stronger here, her snatch be able, should be able to get better. Question. Yes. Uh, do you have any like ratios or anything that you like in terms of the snatch pull to a full snatch, power snatch to full snatch? So the one ratio that we know is pretty consistent is that your power snatch and your snatch should be about 85 to 90%. Now that's, that's depending on how you define a power or what is the game, power or naw? So if you're catching weights, like let's say I she catches it. I think actually Vereshansky wrote, it's one of the chapters, yeah. power or naw. In the, in the old Soviet text. <laughs> so do a power snatch. When we talk about power snatch, we're generally talking about catching it with your hips higher than your knee. So let's go down a little bit lower. A little bit more. Little power, bit more. power, power. Right, power, so when you post naw. a video and you're like, hey, <laughs> hey everybody, is this a power? you're getting into that range where you're probably not being strict enough and it becomes the kind of exercise where it's more of just a, an ego test, right? The other side of the coin, if you do a power snatch, if you catch it really high every time, it's almost too high. The bar is never gonna be in this place. It's just too light a weight. So bend about halfway, a little lower. Right about there is the limit of where we wanna be a power snatch. Obviously, you know, if it's an inch or two lower, inch or two higher, that's not a big deal, but we don't wanna be so close to parallel when we catch them that we just sort of are doing these really strong snatches but not really getting the bar much higher, right? We're kind of in that same position that we were before. So as a ratio, 
knowing what that is, knowing where you catch them. If you're consistent, you always catch them halfway down, be consistent with that and know that the ratio is gonna be reflective of that. So that 85 to 90%, 90% is probably gonna be closer and more accurate for people that catch it kind of lower, whereas 85% is an accurate ratio for people that are really strict with their power snatches, right? And it might even be a little bit lower than that in some cases. Ideally, as you get better as a lifter, your power snatch and power clean should be further to the lower end of that spectrum because you don't need as much bar height. You're already strong. You know, as you get really good as a lifter, your power snatch and power clean are going to be less on the ratio scale. They'll be closer to 85% or maybe even less than that versus your full snatch or full clean because you're more efficient going under the weight. You've already developed the strength to pull the bar high enough. Now everything just gets shifted to being faster under the bar, catching it lower. Make sense? What's your best power snatch? Uh, 20, kilos? Sorry, I don't know kilos. We're still working. We're, st <laughs> we're still converting her to a weightlifter. <laughs> 190 is a little, a little over 85 kilos, right? 85 yeah. kilos, 187. So it's about 86 kilos, 86 and a half kilos. And your best snatch? 100. 100 kilos. Yes, so. I did a good snatch once. <laughs> no, ah, all right, all right. So yeah, I've heard Max's lifting. <laughs> this was before like cell phone videos existed and, and stuff. They had reel to reel, <laughs> the projectors. I've heard Max as a lifter described as the fastest lifter that people had ever seen. And he's also known for front squatting 600 pounds at a 200 pound body weight. It's making him the strongest lifter. And you would think but that the being worst. the strongest and the fastest <laughs> You would have been good. Well, that's a good. <laughs> yeah. You know, my mother said I was very good. Uh, that's a good point, though, actually, because being super, super strong and super, super fast and very good looking, obviously doesn't, doesn't just translate into being really good at the lift because there's one thing missing there, right? You have the physical qualities. You're fast. You're strong. The third thing is skillful, right? How good are you at actually executing the technique of the lift? How, how much time do you spend practicing the lift and in developing good skills, good technique, good, good technical characteristics. So something to be aware of. Just simply emphasizing, well, if I just pull the bar higher and higher and higher and I get stronger and stronger and stronger, I'll be great. Problem with that is, how many of you guys know of one of our male lifters, James Townsend? Young Tony M is his Instagram. Right? Very, so, very ripped black guy, very athletic young daughter, Princess P. You should follow him. You'll do yourselves a favor and go look at his Instagram tonight. Yeah. He's the most powerful, strongest person, super, super explosive. You should and also follow Princess P because yeah. you'd be way ahead of the curve on like the 2032 Olympic team. Yeah. She'll, she'll She's four years old and she did 60 push ups. So, yeah. Yeah. 24 inch box right. jump. <laughs> but in his case, he can power clean 420 pounds and every time they're super high but that's also the same, if not more, than his full clean, okay? So he's, he's put himself in a position where, you know, and, and that just kind of how he got into the sport. He's in late, he's very, you know, a football player, the positions of his body, it's kind of hard for him to get really low. But we can see, right, this guy's got a huge power clean or a huge power snatch, but it doesn't translate into getting under the bar as well because he's only emphasized pulling as high as possible. So the thing we want to focus on with relative height of the bar is that the, we're developing strength to move more weight to the same height. We're always trying to translate that into generating more power so we can lift more weight and get the bar to the same place every time, at the same time developing skill and developing strength. So like we talked about earlier, power snatches are great at developing more skill more, and more strength, more height of the bar. As we go further along that spectrum, snatch high pulls and snatch pulls are also very good at developing some skill but a lot more strength. And then the farthest side of that spectrum is like snatch deadlifts are great at developing strength and okay at developing skill, but not really. And then the one more category even further than that would be like back squats, right? Doing squats or even doing like conventional deadlifts, those will make you generally stronger, which will help you generate more power and pull a heavier weight to the right place. But they're not gonna help your skill at all in the snatch. Having a 600 pound front squat doesn't make you a great snatcher. There's a lot of potential right? And people talk you up a lot, but it doesn't translate into having a great snatch, okay? So things to work on, things to remember is that that's kind of the spectrum we're working with. More skill, 
still helping with bar height, more strength, helping more with strength and, and bar height than actual skill. Any questions? Anyone? <laughs> Jad. Uh, what, what kind of weights are, are you talking about dealing with in the, in the snatch pull to hip and, and high pull uh, per, as far as a percentage of your full lift? So when we talk about the spectrum of, of training technique, and something that's important to note about training technique is that the heavier the weight you train with, the more effect it's going to have. It's going to have a more impactful effect on, on your strength and your skill. That's obvious. If you do a lot of snatches with 90% and above, or really, really heavy weights, you're going to get very good at whatever you're doing there because the intensity is so high. With training technique, it's difficult because we can't go really heavy and do it wrong because then we're just ingraining bad habits. So what we want to do is when we're training for technique, we're training the actual snatch, or we're training the special exercises, we want to keep that intensity light enough that we can do the technique perfectly or as, as close to perfect as possible, as close to what we want as possible, but heavy enough that we get the most benefit out of doing those reps. So if we go, oh yeah, I can do perfect technique with 60%, that's great, but is that really gonna make you, is that really gonna stick? Is that training really gonna have an effect on you? Probably not a lot. But I can snatch 90% every day. I mean, you know, sometimes like I drop it on my head, sometimes I bend my elbow, sometimes like, you know, every single one of them's different. Yeah, you're gonna get kind of stronger, it's gonna make a big impact, but you're not really getting better at lifting. So that sweet spot is between those points. And it's generally going to be somewhere in that 80 to 85% range, maybe 75 to 85%, just depending on, on what is actually wrong with your technique, what you're trying to work on. As a percentage of your actual snatch, when we do pulls, because they have the same effect, right? Really, really heavy deadlifts or really, really heavy pulls are going to change the way your technique is. So when she does a really heavy snatch deadlift, it wouldn't look identical to a snatch or a snatch pull because it's kind of heavy. She's going to maybe be tipped over a tiny bit or be a little bit out of position. She can still go a lot heavier in the snatch pulls and it's usually, you know, up to 120% of your best snatch before it starts to really become maybe detrimental. In the snatch pulls, anything over 90%, while it makes you stronger, is going to have a, a, an effect on your technique that deforms it because the pulls are different than a lift. When you, how many of you guys have done pulls versus doing a lift? It's, you know, your brain's not in it the same. The intensity, the, the having to be patient, make contact, and really be aggressive under the bar isn't there. So pulls are a little bit different technically. And as you get above 90% of your actual snatch as a weight on the bar, you're gonna be more skewed to having slightly worse technique, right? And worse is a relative term. We're talking about just changes in technique. You do a lot of heavy pulls, the downside is you might get kind of slower, right? You might get strong, but you might get slower too. You might be a little out of position. You might be a little bit, you know, forward or back or something that you don't want. You do too many, or you do light, light pulls, really light pulls. The effect is not as intense. It's not going to have as big a change. So it can really help you learn the rhythm and tempo and timing of the pull and develop good, consistent bar height. But its effect isn't going to be as dramatic. So you're going to have to do a lot more of them. And, and in general, it's not going to have as, as strong an impact on your lifting. Make sense? You had a question, Lisa? Yeah. Uh, would it be, say, on the snatch high pulls, yeah. so 70% of your body height, would it be best to like work up and find a weight where, say you're going for, you want to do triples that day, where's the height, what, what's the weight on the bar when you can pull it to that height? Um, so that's... Yeah, so what she's asking is, is, would it be better to find a weight that matches the height you're pulling the bar to rather than just picking an arbitrary percentage and saying that's going to be the right technique? That would be a little bit better. And what one, one exercise we've done and some people used to do a lot that's kind of fallen out of fashion is to set a stick up in the rack. And so when she does a pull, right, so imagine I'm a, a squat rack. This bar is sitting here, right, doing a great job. And she... You're just going to pull the bar up until it touches the, the, the stick, okay? Right? So now she knows every time it's the same height. This is a great exercise to help you develop consistency in the height of the bar. And you can use a little bit lighter weights and still focus on getting full, complete extension, which will help you develop, you know, really good, consistent bar height. So to answer Lisa's question, yeah, a more tailored to the individual way of doing this would be setting a stick up or getting a video 
and making sure you pull the weight to the right height and you focus on that height and use that weight. And that weight may be like, you know, 78% for somebody versus 90% for someone else, rather than everyone just doing the same percentage. Make sense? So this is another good, ex a good example of an exercise that reinforces technique, reinforces consistency, and helps you match the height of the bar to what you're trying to achieve in the lift. Before we take more questions, let's take a little bit of a break, hear about the Beginner's Guide to Weightlifting by Mr. Montana, and uh, then we'll be back with some questions uh, all about relative height of the bar, all things snatch technique, and really whatever anyone wants to ask. So we'll see you in a minute. All right, and we are back at Black Iron Gym in Reno, Nevada with Jug Life Live! <laughs> there we go. Yeah, this is, audience, is get, audience is getting better. We have two kegs from Great Basin Brewing. Thank you to them. Not really thank you to them. I paid for, for them, but yeah, whatever. And uh, so it's, the crowd's only going to get better oh, as, yeah. the, as yeah. the day goes. So we've talked about developing height of the barbell, how that relates to technique, drills to improve that. Um, and now we're going to get into a little bit of uh, Q and A. It's <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> well, yeah, some, qu some questions and answers. So, you know, people watching on YouTube, it's all up to the audience here to have good uh, training questions. So, uh, yeah, YouTube questions. can be harsh, guys. Remember yeah, that. Yeah, the comments are terrible. Good. All right. How often do you guys snatch? Do you snatch every day? Is it... <laughs> Starting out strong, Q. <laughs> so I, I snatch or do some variation of the snatch. I think it's like every other. Well, it depends. How many days a week? So do you train? I train typically five, four to five days out of the week. Well, it's supposed to be five four days to, are written. F yeah, five <laughs> days are written. Sometimes we call audibles, but five days he programs. And I'd say, let's say, Monday I snatch, Tuesday, I usually, I'd say like maybe three. Three to four. Three to four days out of the week I snatch or do some type of snatch-related exercise for the most part. What about you, Alexandra? I snatch four times a week. Yeah. The she only knows. day I don't snatch is Saturday. Yeah, only back She's just she knows. on it. Yeah. He tells me what to do, I just do yeah. it. I just forget. <laughs> so to kind of piggyback on that question, Max, what are some considerations that you would make writing programs when determining how frequently someone should perform the lifts? Well, there's there are a couple of things. One is where their technique is at. So someone who's got, let's say- saying Alex has worse technique than No, you. no, no. That's, so, what, that's what I just heard. <laughs> that's rude. There's a, couple of, there's a couple of factors. One is technique, how good your technique is, how far along in the process of becoming a great weightlifter you are. And then the other is personal, like how the person recovers from training and the actual individual themselves, right? And those factors are more like how big are you, how much, how much do you weigh, how old are you, you know, how much weight are you lifting? So a larger person who's lifting more weight is gonna train less often than a person who's really small and lifts less weights because it just takes less time for a small person to recover. So you guys know Alyssa Ritchie, another girl on our team? She's much smaller than everybody else and she trains a little bit more frequently. She snatches five or six days, in, five or six times in a week versus Q might be like four, three or four times in a week because they're just on the opposite end of the spectrum. The other thing is how efficient your technique is. If you're really- well, Before you say the technique efficiency part, the, this idea of, of lifter size and how it relates to frequency, that's gonna hold true for weightlifting, for powerlifting, yeah. because if we were to, to use a really extreme example, um, you know who Thor Bjornsson is, the mountain from Game of Thrones, six foot nine, 450 pounds. Um, and there's an, another lifter in the IPF named Fedor, uh, or. Sergei Fedosienko. I was thinking of Fedor Emelianenko. I thought you were going to say yeah. Peter Dinklage. But. <laughs> well, yeah, him too. But, uh, but Sergei Fedosienko is world champion, world record, all this stuff. He's like four foot nine. 
And when he's pulling his little sumo deadlift and the bar moves two inches versus when Thor pulls a deadlift and it probably moves the entirety of, of Sergei's body height. You know, it's so much more work for Thor to move that bar that far or Q to pull the bar that far compared to Alyssa. So every rep they do is more work and is thus gonna be harder to recover from. So anytime you have a, a taller lifter who's moving the bar further, a heavier lifter with more muscle mass, and that more muscle mass means it's probably gonna take a little bit longer for that muscle mass to recover, they'll generally train a little bit less frequently. It makes sense. Yeah. Does age factor into that as well? Yes. Definitely, yeah. And the, the age one is, is a bit tough for us to give kind of generalized recommendations on. Is, and we get questions on, on Facebook and YouTube about this quite a bit of, you know, I'm, I'm 45, like how should I change my training compared to the recommendations we're giving in, in whatever video. But when you have a, a master's lifter, let's say, someone who's 45 years old, those first 44 years of their life compared to another 45-year-old lifter, there's way more variability in that compared to if we had a, you know, a 15-year-old. Most 15-year-olds have, you know, th there's just not that great of variability in what they've done up to that point in their life. Um, Mostly sit on a couch and <laughs> empty your fridge and fill your toilet. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, so looking at, at older master's lifters, age has to be considered for sure, but that's gonna be more dependent on, on that individual compared to themselves five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah, they'll do less frequency or less volume than they did five years ago or 10 years ago, but you have to take into consideration what their training history is. Uh, you know, Marissa Inda has been powerlifting for five years. She's 41 years old, but she's been training at least four days, you know, weight training at least four days of uh, every week since she was 17 and then did gymnastics for 10 years before that. So that's way different, you know, let's call it 31 years of, of consistent training versus someone who's 41 years old. who's like, yeah, I started doing CrossFit two years ago, but you know, didn't do shit for 20 years before that. And so the injury history and everything's gonna be so variable. So that's much more of a uh, inter, intra, which one's inside yeah, yourself? Sure. It's one of those. Intra. Intra individual difference. So it's kind of you comparing how much frequency or volume you're doing now compared to what you were doing a year ago, three years ago, five years ago. Because as you get older, your ability to recover is going to decline. But even in, in the, to take a, a more focused look at that, if you have a relatively short training history, you could be building up work capacity. Like if you've only been training for a year, you can probably do a lot more training now than you could a year ago just because you are more fit for that even though you're a year older. So I know a lot of sort of considerations there, but I, I don't want to just give like a blanket recommendation of you're this old, you should train this many times a week. So you say training age is more important than biological age? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it certainly needs to be factored in, and, and that's comparing really one individual to another. Training age needs to be factored in lifestyle factors, there's just a lot of different things to consider. It's, it, it's beyond a blanket recommendation of once you hit, you know, you have your 45th birthday, all right, well now cut a, train, now cut a day of the week out. Like, it, it just doesn't work quite like that. Something, something to consider, if whether you start at the age of 33 or at the age of nine, or yeah, well either way, or start at the age of, I know a guy who started at the age of 50, and either way, you should start as a beginner because if you've never done weightlifting, you need to do a couple things first. One is learn the technique and the process to that is, is pretty straightforward and simple in that you don't need to do an extremely large amount of training to get good at the lifting technique. It, the primary goal is to get good at the technique. So start as a beginner if you're a beginner, right? And then as you go through that process of, of learning the lifting technique, you should get a pretty good gauge as to, okay, I have an easy time recovering from these three or four workouts a week. I think I can, you know, I can try and go a little more than that and see what happens. And if it's too difficult, then backtrack to that. If you find that those three workouts a week are just too exhausting, they're too much, you might back down to two times a week, right? So you can start as a beginner and in the process of being a very 
the initial beginner and getting to the point where your technique becomes solidified, you may learn and use that process to figure out how much you should train. Make sense? All right, Max's wife is, did I turn 47 or 48? 48 this year. Yeah. 29 this, this year. <laughs> 29. Yeah. There was a guy, there was a guy, a local Bay Area guy who started at 50 years old and lifted until he was 80. Extremely good. So the question with that is, because I have, I don't have the flexibility as far as right. my shoulder, and I don't know if it's because I started late and I just have not been doing it. Like, well, like. So yeah, so yeah, so the, you know, it's it's the same thing, right? If you came into the gym and you came in to train, I wouldn't look at you as, well, you're a master. Let's put that filter on you first. You're you're this age, this filter first. Let's look at what do we need to do to develop you into having the right technique. We look at your flexibility, your mobility, all these factors first. We assess those. We make a plan to fix those things and get them up to snuff where we want them, right? And that might include things like if you come in and you've never done lifting or working out at all, you got to start doing some basic, you know, just really basic like cardio and, and just learning how to train every day or learning how to do those things. Once we get to the point where, okay, we know you can learn to snatch now, you start taking on that endeavor and you start practicing the skills, practicing the movements, and then you build from there. There are definitely trainable qualities, yeah. like as far as the positions stuff go, how fast you adapt to them may be a little bit different than had you started 10 years ago or 20 years ago or something. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a trainable quality. I think it's important to with uh, beginner lifters, and I mentioned this to a couple of people during during the, the practical you know, part of today, is to choose exercises that you can accomplish successfully, to like set yourself up for success. Because as you pull a snatch from the ground to the hip, there's a lot more things to screw up than if you pull from the top of the knee to the hip. So if you're screwing up those things from the floor to the top of the knee or the floor to the hip, you can kind of just cut them out and, and do more work from that high hang. So finding the variation, regression, progression of these exercises that you can do really effectively and doing that frequently is gonna be an important thing for long-term success. So what would be a couple of things for us to be able to like track the bar a little bit closer if you're coming out from your body, like a couple of things to work on to start tracking a little bit closer? So the, you know, the first thing when anyone asks me about what you would do to fix technique. The first thing I would say is practice the actual lift, but practice with weights that you can control, right? And then slowly start to overload that and get a little bit heavier, do a little bit more, maintaining that sort of sweet spot where things are staying intact technically. If it happens from the very beginning with an empty bar or with really light weights, you're just out of control or the bar's not where you want it, then the first thing to do is go back even further to drills and work on those drills we practiced, right? Um, shameless plug, the beginner's guide to weightlifting that we have that features Kiana, um, is we have all the same, basically the same progressions we went through today. There's a little more explanation. There's a few more drills and some other stuff, but um, that same process, right? The things you're doing incorrectly, just reduce the weight, reduce the intensity until you can maintain good technique with that, and then slowly build up avoiding going too fast, too heavy too soon, too much work too soon to where it just falls apart again, right? I like to, a really good analogy is imagine you're gonna throw a dart at a dartboard and your goal is to hit the bullseye. If you can't hit the bullseye, you gotta stand 25 feet away. You can't hit the, bull, the bullseye at, at all. You can't even hit the dartboard at all. What would be the first thing to do to fix that, to, to make sure you're actually hitting the dartboard? Step closer, right? So imagine that the distance to the dartboard is the weight on the bar. The closer you get to that bullseye, the easier it is. Obviously, too close, just an empty bar is probably not practical, but you know, get closer and closer until you make it easier for yourself. Get good at that and then just slowly work your way backward, right? And over time, slowly work your way up in weight, slowly work your way up in more and more reps, and you'll start to have solid, consistent technique. So, and this is for snatch, for squat, for whatever, whatever exercise. You have a weight where you hit a, a technical breakdown and so let's say in the squat that, you know, up to 300 pounds, things look sharp and, and your technique is, is good. And then after 300, your hips start to rise early and it's in this funky kind of good morning type of, type of exercise. 
then you want to take that range maybe 260 to 300 and keep doing more and more volume in that range. And then the weight will become 310 where the technical breakdown occurs. And then you're doing you know, 270 to 310 for more and more volume. And that's just going to keep moving up and up. But to, to a little bit more to, to her specific question, this would be an, an issue of bar trajectory, right? Right. So what is a, like a bar trajectory so, exercise? You, you know, like? things that help you reinforce the trajectory of the bar. Generally, if the bar is going front and you're jumping forward, right, you have to make sure that you don't do that. So the first thing and the best thing for most beginners to do is draw a box on the ground, right? That's the width of your foot front to back, the length of your foot, and slightly wider than your feet where you catch the bar. And then every time you lift, set yourself up in that box, and the goal is to not jump out of that box, okay? So try to keep your feet inside the box. If that doesn't work, the next step is to keep your feet on the ground. Don't even move your feet. So if you don't move your feet, you're gonna be forced, your brain is gonna correct things, you're gonna be forced to pull straight again, or pull straighter. If that doesn't work, and you're finding the problem is coming from making contact with your hip, and the bar's going out in front of you, then do things like eliminate a hook grip. So just use a regular grip so that when you hit the bar with your hips, it, it, your, your brain kind of dampens the power because it knows it's gonna come out of your hand, it's gonna pop out of your hand, right? And then reinforce pulling straighter. And then the third would be doing, doing snatches, the exact same, in the box, no feet, not making contact with the body. So you're forced to pull completely vertical. And if that isn't working, then you can go back to like muscle snatches and things where you have complete control of the bar with your upper body uh, and prevent yourself from moving forward, right? Or, or throwing your hips forward. Does that make sense? The other thing too is like the general progression for you guys to think about, and if you keep notes or whatever, but is position first. Make sure your positions are good. So reinforce your start position. Make sure in the videos your shoulders are in the right spot, your hips are in the right spot, that your positions are good. Then the next is, is tempo. Are you moving at the right speed the right time, right? Are you trying to put all your power in right off the ground, or are you waiting for the top? So is your rhythm and tempo good? And the third is speed. Then try to move fast. If those two things are good, then start increasing the actual speed you move. But in general, the goal is to always just slow down, step back, make things more, comp more simple, put more rules on not letting yourself move forward, not doing those things, and you'll start to improve on them. So in general, how long have you seen it take, like, to take athletes to be able to grab the technical skills? Because that's one of the things that I've struggled with is I find some of these lifts, like, very technical, and I don't realize what I'm doing. And people are like, no, like, you're warming up, or you're not getting under it fast enough, your elbows are not higher. And I, like, I don't realize those things that are happening. So a year out from now, like, should I expect to get better? Like, what a... How long have you seen athletes be able to, to grab that? So, took Q a year to break an American record and snatch, right? It took me 20 years to finally realize I was terrible at weightlifting. <laughs> every, every, the, the, time is, is, the time is so different for everybody. What's more important though, and this is something that we talk about a lot, especially with the girls and, and the team, is being process oriented versus being goal oriented. So it's really easy to be like, I, my goal is to be, you know, I want to snatch perfectly. That's my goal. And I'm just every day I come in, I'm going to just do everything perfect and I'm going to get there. The problem with that is every day you come in that you don't hit that goal, it's a failure. And, and you don't have no way to gauge like how close you were to that goal because if you didn't do it perfectly, well, I mean, how far off was I, right? Imagine you can't do one pull-up. How far away from one pull-up are you? Are you just a little bit or are you like negative 10, right? So... Process orientation is the idea that you're focusing on improving the process. And the process in terms of learning technique is that every day you come in, you have a couple of things, one or two things maximum that you're focusing on that day, the simplest pieces of the puzzle, and you're doing those pieces as best you possibly can for the day. So let's say, you know, in the snatch. Well, what's the first thing I need to work on to get really good here? The start position. So every day I come in, I'm gonna make sure that I take the extra time to focus on doing my start position really, really well. And if you do that every single day, you're only focusing on a simple, easily achievable thing that compounds on itself as you get better at it. Then once you kind of master those little pieces and keep putting them together, 
you're going you're gonna to eventually have good technique, right? So instead of saying, I did a lift, I jumped three feet forward, my elbows were slow, I threw my hips back, or my shoulders back too fast, and this is bad, and your coach or somebody else is like, oh, you got to fast your elbows and stay on your feet and this, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's like trying to, you know, build a house all pieces at once. You got to step back and say, okay, what's the biggest problem here? Let me focus on that one thing, one little aspect and master that over the course of, you know, every day of practice. I'm going to work at this little thing. Then the next step, I'm going to work at that little thing. And the next step, I'm going to work at that little thing, right? So this goes to like a four stages of motor learning, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence and unconscious competence. So if you're at the stage where, you know, you're, you're screwing it up and you don't even know what you're screwing up, then you move to, well, you're still doing the stuff wrong, but you know what you're doing wrong, to you're doing it right, but you're thinking your way through every part, to then you just do it. That's just the way that you do it. And the way that I've heard Max describe the transition of beginner to intermediate weightlifting is that when you become a, when you're a beginner, you do something wrong on every lift and it's different. You do a wrong, or a different wrong thing every time. But when you become an intermediate, you keep doing the same wrong thing over and over. So as you can kind of, you know, focus on these one or two things per day, because you'll just paralyze yourself with, you know, paralysis by analysis kind of thing if you're trying to think of 10 different things during the snatch. So as you can break it down to these, to one or two components of the lift each day, and you master the start position, then that's on autopilot. That's on that part of things is on unconscious competence. And then you can move on to the, ne to the next issue, you know, up the chain in the movement. Uh, so, yeah, that's, it's going to be different for everyone based on their own aptitude. But breaking it down into just one or two things per lift and, and per week, and, you know, writing down those, those goals at the beginning of the week, assessing them at the end of the week, uh, you know, obviously being objective and honest with yourself. I think will, we'll, regardless of aptitude, help you get there a little bit faster. Yeah, without a doubt, the process orientation is far, far accelerated than goal, than just fixating on, I got to be like this person, I got to do this, I got to get it now. Focus on each piece, right? Little, little tiny victories all the time, right? Max, how many like perfect weightlifters have you seen in your life? Where like they do a clean that's perfect or a snatch that's perfect the majority of the time? Aside from Team Juggernaut, which every time is perfect. Well, what I mean by that is, like, I feel like people oh. in weightlifting try to like chase perfection. Right. Right. But like yesterday, Q snatched the PR, Alex snatched the PR, and you guys were like, "Oh, like looks better." Like yeah. it wasn't perfect. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I feel like I mean, people sometimes are unrealistic. I can't. You know, it's it's there's there's a, there's like you know there's probably some freak five five or ten of them that have ever existed that did everything perfectly all the time, right? But you know, it's like. Even Ilya, the bar goes yeah. away from him off the floor. Like this. Every lifter is going to do things kind of awkward in some little places. They just, there are, sure, there's a couple of guys here, women here and there, that are just absolutely amazing, and they stand out head and shoulders above every other genetic freak at the Olympics because they're like, wow, this is like, that person's flawless, and they're better than everyone else who's also super, super good. But that's so rare. I mean, I can't even think off the top of my head of two or three of them that are there, right? But I can think of lots and lots of people that are really, really, really good because they spent a lot of time on those little pieces, right? Um, what drills or accessory work would you do to improve the overhead strength and stability in the snatch? Uh, Q can answer, actually, some of the stuff she does. <laughs> well, no, I mean, some of the overhead stuff we do, we have done. In the past? What um, things do you think have helped? What have I done? I don't do those anymore because I was snatch broken. Balance. I do snatch balance. I'm awful at snatch balance, but that actually does help me a lot. I haven't done a lot because my shoulder's been tweaked, but that definitely helps. As you can tell, if you ever watch some of my videos, like I sit at the bottom a lot, but I tend to get a little like jerky and whatnot. So snatch balances help a lot. Um, snatch push presses help a lot. I would say those two for me have helped for the most part. And just like overhead holds too, I make myself do those, and that kind of like helps. heavy single arm overhead. Like I like single like to warm up heavy single arm like overhead dumbbell walks, and I like snatch balances a lot too. I um, hate them, but they're good for you. And then um, 
I like to just like sometimes sit at the bottom and hold for like 30 seconds um, yeah. just to warm up my position. Oh yeah, those and just hang the neck, out. Like, sats press. Whatever mm, I like sats press is really good to warm up. Yeah. Like kettlebell arm bars. There's a lot of stuff you can do for shoulder stability. Yeah. It was like the simplest fix where you don't have to add anything extra yeah. to your training. Is when you catch a snatch, you stand up with it, hold it at the top for you know a three count before you drop it instead of just maybe not quite getting the top and dropping yeah. it. Or when you catch it in the bottom, you know, hold it one, two, three, then stand up, add an overhead squat, you know, do a snatch plus an extra overhead squat. We don't have to really add an extra exercise yeah. to what you're doing. We also have a YouTube video called Improving Overhead Squat Movement with uh, Dr. Quinn Hennock, and that would be a good one to watch, I'm sure, as well. Let's go here, then there. Um, for the ladies, how often do you guys come in and set up to actually do a workout to PR? I'd say f They better well. do it every day. <laughs> 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 like Friday's like our big, like our big lifting day, I would consider. We're always kind of, I believe, waiting for Friday to come because that's what we call the tens day. Well, I guess it depends, eight to tens. Yeah. And that's like our big PR day. So that yesterday, that would have been like a big PR day, even though I PR'd that Monday. Well, so <laughs> imagine 12, 15 weeks leading up to a meet. Those first four to six weeks, yeah, it's probably like, not even going to touch heavyweights yeah, it's that are near chill. PR level. And then as you get closer. PR singles. But PR singles, might yeah. Squat, you know, yeah. Might squat a PR set of eight yeah. or something along the yeah. way. But for testing, like a, a single PR. Yeah, probably not as often, you know, the last... The last four to five to six weeks, five to seven weeks total would be like, you know, if, if your training was pretty good up to that point, you did enough volume and things improved, those PRs will kind of start to come, right? And you probably have hit more because you changed your training You've hit a like bit. PRs all the yeah, time. Yeah, so I just started working with um, Max maybe, how many, like eight weeks? Four days ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just maybe like a, a month in. and a half like ago. A yeah. Flash sale. But today. I've PR'd several things every single week since we've started. You know, like middle, middle of December, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah since meet. right after the last meet. Yeah. Um, so it's different. Like, I have a lot more room to PR because I've been yeah. hurt. How many PRs do you think you've made since then? So many. She's in a lot of PRs like, every since you week, started. Like, multiple. Right. Every week, multiple PRs. So let's let's say <laughs> that's like 16 PRs in eight weeks. So would you say that Juggernaut Coaching averages <laughs> two plus PRs per week? By science. I mean, that's yeah. sounds like science. <laughs> One thing. So so this is a really quick thing that might help for when you should PR, right? There, there's always a process of some kind of accumulation of what you've done, accumulation of volume and training, and and the the process of 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 training that should be indic indicative of a PR going to happen. So if you're going into the gym every Friday thinking there's going to be a PR, but the last five, four, five, six weeks have not, had not lent you to believe that's going to happen, right? So imagine like a savings account. If you don't put money in a savings account every week, 15 weeks later, you're not going to expect to look in the savings account and be like, oh yeah, there's like 5,000 bucks in there, right? you should expect exactly what's in there. So the same with the savings account, it's like training. If you're doing good training that's, that's process oriented and you're working at your details and fixing those as you go, your training is getting progressively more challenging but manageable and, and successful, then you know that as that keeps going, that process keeps going, it's inevitable that a PR is gonna happen, right? The, the knowing exactly when it's gonna happen is more the art of coaching and, and lining that up for people so that, you know, Q and Alex PR at the competition on that day is much more of the, the art of a, a coach, right? But as training goes, if you're putting in good solid work that's getting, that's getting you better and progressing you forward at a moderate pace, that you know, okay, after several weeks of this, you know, there's something due here, something's going to happen, right? If you've gone through five or six weeks of training and you don't hit a PR, right, you can then look back on your training and say, well, what happened? What did I not do? What did I do too much of? What things did I, where did I go wrong here that there wasn't this higher level of ability that I should have had? And, and so much of that, and this is maybe a bit bigger discussion of like a fitness fatigue relationship, is that to make PRs when they matter, you have to have parts of your training where you basically can't make PRs. Yeah. 
where you're fatigued and you run down and you just kind of slog through these hard workouts, knowing that, and especially for weightlifting where uh, speed qualities are so important, like compared to powerlifting, time, times where you feel run down and your technique feels a little off or you feel slow and understand that that's all part of the bigger process to make a bigger lift when, the, when it actually matters. I know. <laughs> because training, training that where you PR all the time or you're always peaked, like if you're always peaked, you're actually never peaked because you're, you're you know, on, a, on a long plateau or a, a very slight incline. But when you do train that's really hard early and hard from a volume standpoint usually for weightlifting, you're squatting eights, you're squatting tens, you're doing higher volume of pulling and, and everything, or you know, three plus ones and, and like three, three cleans plus one jerk. You, ca you can't do all of that Monday through Thursday and be like, all right, well, uh, max out Friday, gonna hit, a, gonna hit a PR. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But investing all that work early is gonna be what creates a big return later when it, when it really counts. Let's go last question back there. Whoa, pressure. Yeah. So this is a kind of a technical question. In your book, Beginner's Guide to Weightlifting, when you're describing the catch phase during the snatch, yeah. you talk about uh, internally rotating your shoulders or having a neutral shoulder. All I've ever heard and learned is to have an externally rotated shoulder to engage your lats and catch the bar. Can you describe the difference is in yeah. catching in an internal or an externally rotated shoulder. The, the people that are telling you to catch it with externally rotated shoulder have never coached an American record holder. Uh -huh. Or a world record holder. <laughs> no. So what's probably, I have to, it, so I don't like to say this person's wrong because who knows exactly what they're saying, right? What, what I can say from, and all I can say is from my practical experience, is that one, not everyone's gonna be the same. So some people may have a shoulder. If, they're, if their torso is really upright when they land, being internally rotated is not necessary, right? I used to coach a guy who'd catch his bar, he'd be totally vertical in the bottom of the snatch. His shoulder was basically neutral the whole time. He had an American record, right? Q tips over a little bit, but she's still pretty neutral, pretty, pretty vertical. Is gonna ha also has a, rec a record, right? Other people, they may be tipped over quite a bit and, and catch the bar overhead with a more internally rotated shoulder. So to say it's universal across the board, everyone's gotta be this way, would be, I don't wanna put myself in that position. But what I can say most likely is that the person that's telling you that or that people that are telling you absolutes, like gotta be excellently rotated for this, this, and this reason, is probably just picking that out of thin air and creating a, creating a you know, falsehood that's not, that's just, you know, they're just saying that so that you, you know, they have something to say. What about torque? Torque, yeah. Is it, where, where do you Are hear you the, with torque? where do you hear the external rotation from? Uh, I've heard from uh, Julian Mel Strong Fit. He's yeah. talked about, he's talked about torque recently in the last couple of weeks, uh, saying ways to yeah. create that internal or external motion just to keep everything up when you're in overhead work. That's what you have to do. And, so, and awesome. even in, even just regular CrossFit classes, when yeah. you max out so, the overhead squat. What I would say, and and I, not in our like, class, not with us. I don't want to. <laughs> when the cameras are off, when the, when the cameras are off, I tell you. But here's what I would do, and this is advice I would give to every single person in this room. If you want to get good at something, and you want to know the actual answers. Right? If I wanted to learn how to trade stocks, where would I go? Probably go to the stock exchange and find guys that are actually doing it. So I wanted to learn weightlifting, I would go to a weightlifting meet because there's real coaches there. You go to national championships. Every time I go to national championships, I see the same faces. At the world championships, I see the same coaches. Right? All my friends, all these guys, I've known them, guys and girls, these people are always at the same meets. They're always doing the actual thing because that's what works. That's what makes them successful as coaches. So Julian Pinot, I don't know if he's ever even done a fucking snatch, right? I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to be a jerk about him, but here's an example of a guy beer, who's so. just saying it and he probably has a huge reach. But what he's saying is just, I mean, just do it and tell me if it works well, 
right? Does it make sense? Where it's, it's super easy to be a guru and to say it without ever having to prove it. But the places that you're gonna find for sure that people prove it are competitions. Because I can guarantee that when I'm at a competition with me and my lifters and going up against other lifters, a squad. every single fiber of my being wants to win. And, nobody fucking wins and I'm later. only gonna do stuff that, that's gonna help us win, right? So I don't care. To me, I don't care if externally rotated is right or internally rotated is right. I only care what helps us win. And I gravitate to the things that work. And it just happens to be, right, that that's the thing. Does it make sense? So it's not, my choices in what we do are always grounded in success and results based, where a lot of gurus and internet people and, and the sort of fitness community, it's based in what's going what's gonna to contradict or what's going to be like something that's too difficult for people to do so they feel like they're always wrong. So when they have to keep trying to do it, and then they keep coming back to me for the answer because I'm the guy who keeps telling them to do it better, right? And it's just a cycle that, that you know, will eventually build their success or build their fame or whatever. Does that make sense? If you want to become good at weightlifting, then the, the most important thing to do is go to places where people are actually doing weightlifting and are not internet gurus. <laughs>All right, that is the Jug Life Podcast. Um, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, the iHeart Radio app, and of course at thejuglife.com. If you like what you hear or see, you could go on iTunes and give us a five-star review, write us something funny or nice, and maybe we'll read it on the air, and then you can win something like JME, maybe James, I don't know. JME Dorsey is his name yeah you can spell it out for yourself on the on the internet figure out if this is you talking about us <laughs> heavy on smarts well then this podcast is very informative and easy to listen to chad and max do a great job disseminating their knowledge and it's much appreciated they're pretty funny too and their chemistry is great bump this <laughs> Power lifters and Olympic lifters alike will benefit from listening. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. Go ahead and uh, shoot me an email at chat at jtsstrength.com, and uh, I'll send you out a little gift for, for writing us a nice review like that. Um, so, yeah, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube, where we're always very proud of our content. Three videos per week, thanks to the world's strongest videographer, Shorty Sedang. And you see him... He looks small over there, but Shorty did like 500 pounds. 500 pounds, this little guy over here. Yep. And, uh, if you're interested in online coaching, we have a lot of that uh, for powerlifting, weightlifting, and super total and power building. And uh, when this comes out, strongman as well. You can find all that at juggernautcoaching.com. Upcoming events. You'll be in the Netherlands when this happens. So. Yeah. Uh, you have any just weightlifting ones scheduled? Uh, not yet. Okay. Not on the board. In late March, March 23rd and 24th, uh, we will be in New York at JDI Barbell on Friday the 23rd and uh, Outlift Athletics in Long Island on Saturday the 24th for two more Jug Life live events. And this one was fun, right? It was fun? Yeah, see, they think it's good, so... So we'll be there for two more Jug Life Lives. Um, I'll be in Australia right before that. In Brisbane, Canberra, and Melbourne, you can visit events, uh, the events section at store.jtsstrength.com to learn more about those. And on April 13th, Friday the 13th, we'll be at CrossFit Oakland for another Jug Life Live. And you guys will be there too, in case you didn't know. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So go to the events section at store.jtsstrength.com and find all of those. Um, yeah, online coaching, YouTube, all that stuff. Yeah. Social media. Q, where can they find you? Chucky Wild Chat. I was going to say, Mom's going to skip my email address. <laughs> <laughs> you just Chucky got a lot of. Dang it. Chucky Watch on Instagram. And don't email me. No pants, the chance. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Thanks. <laughs> That's it. You can find me Max underscore Ada on Instagram or Facebook, or you can email me Max JTS Strength. If you have any questions about any of the coaching 
or anything really. And I'm Chad Wesley Smith at Chad Wesley Smith and at Juggernaut Training on Facebook and Instagram, filling up your news feed all day. Thank you to Black Iron Jim here in Reno, Nevada, and our excellent audience today for the Black Iron. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.